Thanks very much and <clears throat> welcome everyone. Good afternoon. Um, my name is John Walton. I'm subject advisor here at Pearson for the edX Cell Geography. Um, and I've got my colleague Isla Billet, who is um, heading up our humanities team. Uh, she's also on the call today and um, we're, we're um, going to hopefully go through all of the information you need um, for uh, summer 2021 arrangements um, and also be able to answer some of your questions as well. Now, it's quite a big group we've got in today, which is fab because uh, we've got GCSE and A-level in the same room. That does mean uh, we might not be able to answer every single specific question today in the chat just because there's two of us and over 100 of you. So what we have done is we've obviously got the events recorded, so you're going to have, you know, be able to refer to that later, and you can download the materials. And also um, we've collated some, some FAQs, some geography-specific uh, FAQs at the end of this session. So uh, we'll talk through those. So hopefully those will cover off most of the, the overall themes that most of you have got in terms of your questions. I can see a few questions coming in now, and I'm thinking, yeah, we're going to cover that in the presentation. So I think um, probably for your sakes, if you want to hold, hold fire on your questions until you've, you've kind of heard the, um, heard the presentation and the FAQs that will go through towards the end. Um, and then, of course, uh, if anything you feel needs clarification or, or um, you need to ask something, um, yeah, in a different way, uh, it doesn't make sense the way we couched it. Do do use the chat. So we've got the group chat which you can ask, talk to each other, uh, and obviously we can try and pick that up. General themes as well, and then we've got the Q and A box uh, as well, which you'll go straight through to Isla um, in the background while, I, while I'm doing the presentation. So um, hopefully that's that's kind of makes sense. Um, so let's let's start. Um, so just the agenda then. We're going to look at some of the um, context, uh, key dates, and deadlines. Um, I'll give you a quick overview of the JCQ guidance, which is key to all of this. Um, I'll give you an overview of our support, and then we'll get into those more specific, um, frequently asked questions, and obviously some of the answers there. So in terms of context. This, I guess, you know, is a very, very quick overview of the process this year, just really to make sure everyone's on the same page. Students will get their grades determined by teachers. Um, you'll only be making those judgments based on the content that they've been taught. No algorithm this year, or last year, uh, but no algorithm. That's been ruled out much earlier on. Uh, teachers will be able to draw on a range of evidence when determining grades. Uh, obviously, mock exams, NEA slash coursework, other work completed part of the course, essays in class, homeworks, anything like that, plus um, the use of questions uh, that we've provided or uh, we've, we've chunked up for you to use as part of additional assessment media, uh, materials, which are optional. Um, JCQ have provided a lot of guidance, which I'll talk about. We've also provided... Um, kind of digest of that guidance and we've provided other guidance as well in terms of grade exemplification with actual student answers linked to different grade descriptors, which we'll talk about later. Um, <clears throat> key deadline is the 18th of June to submit those teacher assessment grades. And then the results days this year are slightly earlier than, than you expect. And they're both GCSE and A-level in the same week. That's the week of the night starting the 9th of uh, week commencing 9th of August with GCE on the 10th and GCSC on the 12th with the usual day before for centres to see their results before releasing to students. So let's have a quick look at the timelines. Um, I guess we're now at the end of April, aren't we? So key deadline coming up there in the middle of that, that slide, 30th of April is the deadline for centres to get their quality assurance policy submitted by the... Um, Centre of Admin Portal, which your exams officer will be familiar with, even if you're not. Um, throughout April, we have been releasing, has been key, so we've been releasing that, that marking guidance and that UK grading exemplification, as well as obviously the additional 
assessment materials that I mentioned, which are all the past questions chunked up, so you can use them if you want to, to, to generate the evidence for your holistic judgment. Going forward then, another key deadline will be that window of the 26th of May to the 18th of June to submit the teacher-assessed grades. And then again, those uh, results days uh, earlier there in August on the 10th and the 12th. Um, so let's move on to um, JCQ guidance. And this is, you might think, why, why is he talking about this? Well, this is really key. Um, because this is how the whole process this year has been coordinated so that it's consistent across all the exam boards. Um, and it's the same, whichever exam board you're, you're taking in terms of what guidance we're allowed to produce and that we've decided to produce. And also the process that you'll go through uh, for awarding those, um, those centre, sorry, teacher assess grades this year. Um, so the key thing from the JCQ that you all must download if you haven't already and read is that is that document that I've highlighted in the bottom in yellow, which is the JCQ guidance on the determination of grades for AS, A slash AS levels and GCSEs for summer 2021. And that's an absolutely key document. Now, we have produced um, guidance on our website as well, um, particularly around um, important Important things to do, uh, things to note, note and checklists, which you can grab. Um, I've also included it on that slide, 10 important things to note, which are, are linked to that, um, to that document, pulls out the key things to note. Um, so yeah, make sure you've got that document. Um, and the things, other key documents are the editable centre policy, which is your centre level quality assurance document and policy, which lays out the centre level, not subject level, how you're going to, how you're going to, um, what evidence you're going to use and how you're going to use it. And then the assessment record sheet, which is going to be the most important thing for you as teachers, I think, because um, that's going to be where you record what you've used for your subject and any exceptions for. Uh, different approach to your centre policy. Um, and the head of department checklist will be important for you as well to make sure that you, you've done what you need to do. And of course, those all important grade descriptors, which uh, I'm sure you're all aware of uh, on the JCQ website, which are key, are key in this process of awarding grades. Um, and as I say, we've summarised this on our website because it's quite a useful uh, checklist document. I think it's 10, yeah, 10, 10 point checklist which you can grab off this slide. So in the next slide, I'm gonna pull out a few of the key things from that JCQ guidance. The first one being this center level quality assurance process. And this graphic's all about that. Uh, as I mentioned, the important deadline is the end of this week, the 30th of April to get that policy submitted. This will probably be your SLT doing this. You may, you may have awareness, so you should have awareness of it. Uh, if you, even if you're not involved in it, and that's uh, completing that, confirming the key details of your policy and submitting it via the, the portal, and that will be um, coming through centrally to, to us, depending or an, an awarding organisation, depending on your centre number, and those will be reviewed by awarding organisations, and there'll be virtual centre visits where we feel there's extra support needed. This is all throughout April and May and any guidance given. And then the next key uh, point is stage three there, which is after you've submitted your grades, there'll be quality assurance uh, via the random as targeted and sampling of your, your uh, um, great, yeah, uh, of centre policies uh, and the evidence that underpins pins the grades. Um, so really key thing is to make sure that you are, as teachers or heads of department, you're aligned with this policy and following it. That's going to be really important if, uh, for, particularly when you get to appeals and, and things after results, that you follow that policy. Uh, and your SLT obviously will be guiding you on, on that, um, making sure that you follow that policy and that you've all bought into it. Um, on that stage three, there's more info on, they're actually off call, just, just blogged, I think, a couple of days ago. Tuesday, no, hang on, we're only Tuesday now. 
think it was on Thursday, they blogged um, about that um, sampling that's going to happen after, sorry, sampling of the evidence, pre-results, post-submission. Um, and they said that, that uh, centres will all have to submit a work for uh, for A-level of one at least one subject, five students, this is A-level, and for GCSE, uh, two GCSE subjects, at least five students each, and one of those is likely to be maths or English. So the probability that geography will be included in, in any of this random sampling is, well, I'm not going to do the maths, but... Um, you can see that it's 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 um, the sampling is 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 very very targeted, um, and from the, from June the twenty first, so you, you're, the, the window closes on the eighteenth of June, and you might have seen some um, you might have seen some stuff in the uh, in the news about this. But from the eighteenth of June, after the, the tag portal closes, from the twenty first of June. We can tell, we, we will tell you what subjects and students we want to see, and you've got 48 hours to submit that evidence. If we have concerns, we could ask for more evidence and more subjects, uh, and we may ask you to reconsider grades. So that's, I think, just an overview of the quality assurance process. This slide, um, I'm just going to read out those five bullets, really, because they're quite important uh, and quite sort of underpinning cornerstone to this whole process. Every centre must produce a centre policy, um, and this can be done by choosing to adopt the pre-populated template. Only one policy needs to be produced by the CAP, and that includes if you deliver IGCSE, international GCSE, I should say, as well. Um, you still only need the one policy. Um, the policy must provide a summary of the centre's approach to assessment and quality assuring the centre determining grades they award based on the evidence that's being produced. And for every centre, the head of centre is required to complete a summary of centre policy form to upload to the centre policy portal as an attachment. Cent submission of the centre policy must be completed by the end of the week. And really, uh, as teachers, you, you really just need to make sure that your grading is in line with the centre policy. That's going to be the key time that you need to kind of refer to it. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more in detail about how grading, how this applies to geography in the FAQ section. Um, but essentially, this is the high level stuff again. Um, the teacher assessment grades are going to be uh, holistic and objective judgments based on evidence in performance rather than potential or predictions. Evidence must be used consistently across the class or the cohort wherever possible. But evidence can come from any point across the course of study. It doesn't all have to be done um, via kind of assessments done kind of after, after Easter. Um, heads of centres ensure students have the opportunity to show the full breadth of their knowledge and understanding in geography um, on what they've been taught. So the head of centre will sign off on that, that piece. Um, uh, and... Teachers, um, just, just be aware of, of all the support. And there's a really useful overview document on each of the qualification pages. So for A-level geography and GCSE, A, GCSB, uh, quite uh, under 2021 support, you can access uh, this overview document. There's a little kind of image there. That, I think that one's from maths. But um, it gives you a kind of it's an interactive PDF, and it gives you links to all of the key support uh, around grading. So in terms of arriving at a grade, um, you should be familiar with this if you've, if you've seen the JCQ document. Um, there's a huge amount of guidance about arriving at grades, but the key stages or steps, if you like, are considering what's been taught because you're not going to generate or going to collect evidence for stuff that you've not taught. Uh, collect that evidence, evaluate the quality of the evidence, uh, establish the proposed range of evidence is suitable for all students. And that's really important because of the situation we're in with the pandemic. There may be students that have been particularly affected by lockdown, and so they may need alternative evidence um, to what you're using for the for the main cohort. So that's fine as long as that's all recorded on that assessment record sheet. And it, there's a proper rationale for it. It can be justified. And obviously, if we followed up with QHX, that could all be substantiated and supported. And then finally, you know, assign that grade. 
So you just need to give that user judgment, professional judgment, and give a, um, a rationale. Um, so you might say that you're going to use consistent evidence um, for every subject. Yeah, you're going to do use mocks, but you're also going to use an item of classwork which is different across all the classes. For example, could be your rationale. I'm not suggesting that is a rationale, but it's just an example of what you what you might, as your centre, you might say we're going to do A, X, and Y, and that's going to be what we're going to do against for all, all the classes. But this part of it is going to be different for each class just because of the nature of what's happened to those classes over the last 18 months. And all classes have different teachers and contexts, of course. So thinking about the grade descriptors, so these are key. Now, these, again, got quite a lot of attention when they were released, um, quite a lot of attention. <clears throat> um, but they are the most important tool uh, you're going to need in assigning your teacher assessment grades. And they're the same for all the awarding bodies, all the exam boards for each subject. They describe the mid-grade performance for each grade. And contrary to this slide, they have actually just been updated and do include uh, grades uh, nine and seven for GCSE and A and uh, I think A and A star, sorry, A star for uh, A level. Um, the grading exemplification on our website uses real student work to match um, actual student responses to past questions to these grade descriptors. So although these are rather generic, the grade descriptors, um, if you use them in conjunction with the grade exemplification, they hopefully will provide you with the uh, all-important tool to give you the information and the evidence you need and the indicators you need to say what, what level each student is performing at. Um, so it's not about kind of doing lots of assessments and then applying some mathematical formula and coming out to spit out a grade. It's very much looking at the level of performance they are. So inspecting work and, and, and inspecting um, the evidence uh, and coming up with uh, that grade. Of course, data can be used uh, to validate your your uh, and internally QA your 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 um, your internal your teacher assessed grades. But the starting point should be about the quality of the evidence, the performance of the work, the level of performance in the work that students have produced in, in relation to those grade descriptors. Um, so as I mentioned, just the data then, I know schools are very driven by data. And most schools will have tracking systems for a target grade, for example, and but these should not be used as the basis for a teacher assessment grade, uh, as you need to use the evidence of actual performance, not future projections or targets. So um, that's really important. As I say, you can use data to validate your teacher assessment grades, as long as they're not the driver uh, of those judgments. Um, the other thing is, when you look at past performance, looking at your past data, um, you can use this as part of your QA process to decide outcomes, um, to check that outcomes are broadly in line with the past. It's worth remembering that, again, this shouldn't drive your teacher assessment grades. They don't have to be in line with your past performance, and what, what, what your grade profile was like last, last year or the year before, over the last three years. But this data can support QA, so it just shouldn't drive it, OK? Um, all times, evidence of student work forms the basis of the grade and not the data, all right? So I think that's, that's a tricky balance, because I know everyone's very data-driven. But I think if you just look at it, as long as you start, your starting point is with the evidence and the data is to supplement and validate, um, that's the right approach, or that's a valid approach. <clears throat> So let's have a look at the additional assessment materials. So these have been on our website, hopefully. Uh, I think they've been on since the end of March. Hopefully everyone's had a chance to have a look at them. And they contain all the past papers, uh, pretty much broken down um, question by question. And this is an approach that was agreed by um, Ofqual and JCQ and all the warning bodies to do this. Um, they also provide mapping grid, grid so you can see uh, by um, you know, question type and, and ex exactly what each question is targeting and assessing. 
And then, as I say, we 19th of April, we released the marking and grading exemplification, um, which is really key with those generic grade descriptions to use along with these assess additional assessment materials if you choose to use the additional assessment materials because those are actually optional. As well as all the existing exemplars we've got that we published in 2018 and 2019. Again, those are all, all, all fine to use as well. Um, a little bit more about additional assessment materials then. Um, they cover past papers um, and at least well, for us, it's 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 2018 and 2019 because they're the only only ones we've we've got really, um, so I, I, but the only ones that were run as proper series. Um, as I say, they are um, available. They have been available as, as full papers, but now they're available as as, as kind of itemised um, questions, so you can build your own assessments or at least uh, use them as reference to build your own assessments using exam wizards or, or, or whatever. So hopefully that is helpful. Looking at reasonable adjustments then, your coordinator uh, SNCOs um, will simply need to apply in the normal way if students need those. Um, again, similarly, if you need modified papers or anything adapted, again, uh, do get in touch um, and we'll do our best as we would do uh, normally to try and provide provide that support for, for you. I mentioned appeals earlier um, <clears throat> in the context of the policy. So the guidance um, in the JCQ document about appeals is, is this here on this slide essentially. Um, and the aim of the process this year, of the whole of this teacher assessment grades um, process, is to give students a lot, lot more agency in what they're doing. So they they are actually doing they're doing something. Um, well, they are they 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 their grades are based on the performance that they're currently at, or they're they're at they're not you know they're working at right now. Um, so they're, they're, that's that's good, and then. Um, any information that you sh you should share information about what what evidence you're using to demonstrate that performance with them, so they should buy into the evidence that you're using, and the marks that you're giving them for tests and assessments done to generate or to support those teacher assessment grades. Um, you're not you know you can't tell them the overall holistic teacher assessment grade. Um, you know you're not permitted to do that. But you can tell them and be upfront and open about what what evidence uh, is being used to to make that judgment call on the holistic teacher assessment grade. In terms of appeals, then, if students are unhappy, they can ask for um, check uh, centre to check for admin or procedural error, um, and then if the centre finds that there has been a mistake, then they can um, submit a revised grade to us. And we can consider we'll consider that. If the centre doesn't think that there's been a, an error, um, then the student can ask the centre to appeal on their behalf to us, to the exam board. Um, um, as long as uh, yeah, yeah, so we need to have the um, see the evidence, obviously, that the centre used for that grade, and then we will uh, reflect on that those judgments. Um, and if if we think that there's, if, sorry, if we um, judge that that the grade wasn't determined uh, correctly, then we can um, we can adjust that grade. Um, it could be adjusted down as well as up. So um, that's that's something to consider as well. Um, we can also check um, that the centres followed their processes, their centre policy. That's another thing that we can do. So that covers off the centralised JCQ guidance. Now let's have a quick look at um, some of our support. Um, first, I'll draw your attention to our Pearson Professional Development Academy. You may not be aware of this because it's fairly new, but it's um, it's been signposted in the Pearson qualifications bulletins that have been being sent out in the, over the last few months. Uh, and you can access it from the 2021 support pages on the website. And it's great because it's got all of the video guides, uh, events like this, 
and um, all the checklists that I mentioned you can download. So it's, it's really useful um, to provide, um, not subject specific necessarily, but sort of generic overview on what you need uh, to do for this year. Yeah, so um, those are key things that I kind of, um, you really need to be kind of looking at the support pages for summer 2021, the uh, Ofqual website. I should think add there the JCQ pages, really important, and that document that I keep talking about needs to be on that slide. And sign up to receive uh, the regular qualification updates through the Pearson Qualifications Bulletin. Again, you can do that by the link, which you can download. Quick note about the MOX service. So the window has closed for your year 11 and 13s to use this service now, but you can still use it for year 10s and, and, uh, and 12s. It's the closing date of the 10th of May for that. Um, but that could be um, useful. Um, to to still get in there for your year 10s and 12s for the mocks for next year. Um, just to say, we recognise it's obviously a very stressful time for the students, parents, and carers, and so we have actually got a lot of uh, support for those for those those colleagues as well, um, as well as colleagues. We've got support for students, parents, and carers. Um, so I think it's really worth worth uh, tapping into that, particularly if you've got, if you're getting communications from your parents and obviously students worrying about this sort of thing, do use that as a resource. Um, because it's, uh, you know, it's all part of the, the, the issue surrounding the pandemic, I think. It's quite a, it's a big, it's a package of, of uh, mitigations and measures really that that are needed to be considered, I think, not just grades. So um, this part of the presentation, we're going to look at some, some FAQs for geography. Um, they may not seem incredibly ge geography specific, but that's pro probably because the same issues affect many subjects or most subjects. So. Um, we shall start with uh, looking at evidence. There's a few questions we've got around evidence that we'll be getting in. Uh, the first one here is about how many pieces of evidence do we have to submit? Is there a minimum? So no, there's no requirement for a minimum amount of evidence. How many pieces uh, and um, isn't as important as the quality? So it's about the quality of the evidence rather than the quantity. Um, so how reliable is that evidence as an indicator of students' performance? So an example there, was it a full pass paper done under controlled conditions or an essay done for homework? Um, a rough guide is to look at how much assessment that your students would have normally done uh, in, in summer 2021 and try and get um, assessments across all the to topics you've taught and a range of AOs, okay? So that's what that's what you should be targeting. Um, the NEA should be used for A-level, unless obviously, for whatever reason, it wasn't produced, and there will be cases where it wasn't possible, but we've been very much encouraging it to be continued in various adapted form using virtual primary data collection and the rest. Um, and the key to how much evidence you need will be what's in your centre policy. Uh, that's what will drive all of this. Um, the JCQ have got some worked examples on their website uh, in that document, I think. Maybe if not, no, it might not be in that one. No, it's in a separate document, but you can you can grab it there. And that's really useful for giving you um, examples of how um, different scenarios um, of different students can, can all tie up to different types of evidence. Another one then on evidence is, is there a minimum requirement of the content that needs to be taught to submit a teacher assessment grade? So again, no, there is no prescribed minimum amount of content that you need to have delivered in order to assign a teacher assessment grade. But when the head of centre um, does the centre declaration, they'll confirm 
that students have been taught sufficient content for the basis of a grade and that your students are progression ready, if you like, or they've got enough skills, knowledge and understanding to progress on to the next level of study. So um, that's important to consider at the centre level that they've been taught the course in enough, enough of the course. Um, as I mentioned, there's an expectation that teaching and learning continues as long as possible this year. Uh, some of the content might be appropriate to be assessed on, um, might have to be, still have to be taught. Um, it depend on the centre and how much you needed to re you might need to revisit, depending on how teaching and learning went during lockdown. For example, you might have found a whole topic um, wasn't wasn't successfully delivered for whatever reason, uh, might need to be covered, and there might need to be an assessment around that. Um, so, but in terms of co content delivery, um, certainly there isn't a, a minimum amount, but we obviously, uh, ideally, uh, as much of, the, much of the course as possible. Um, again, on evidence, do we need to provide evidence from all the topics? Well, going back to this again, ideally, yes. Um, and the evidence should cover all the assessment objectives as well. Uh, and this, this way, you know, you can be confident your head of centre can sign off the students are that are progression ready and able to move on. Um, it does go back to what I said on the previous slide, about continuing the teaching of the spec content for as long as you can before getting, getting into the assessment side of things and the, and the collection of evidence. Um, but if you feel that something isn't secure, that you may have delivered in a period, a particularly bad period last year, um, it might be appropriate to reteach it and maybe then do a, sub, a, a mini assessment around that to, to, to kind of gather, gather evidence on that. Um, just like any other year, we never assess every aspect of the spec in a normal exam, so there's no expectation that you would try and assess every single permutation of every topic or even every single kind of key idea or, you know, even subtopics within topics. Sometimes we don't assess because, we, you know, we select, we select from year to year whether we're going to look at water or climate change in depth or, um, uh, yeah, hazards or climate change or, or something like that. So... <clears throat> There isn't any requirement that you have to do everything, cover every single, uh, every part of the spec. Similarly, with question types, you don't have to make sure that you've covered off all the different question types. Um, and in fact, our question types appear on each, on, on repeat on component one, two, and three, don't they? So, you know, if you've done an evaluate question on paper two, um, then there's no, you don't have to then repeat and do them on on the on other papers. Uh, I think as long as you've got a selection of the of the question types across all of your evidence, all of your assessments, then I think that's absolutely fine. You don't need to have them for each topic or even each paper. And finally, on evidence, oh no, not finally, uh, penultimately on evidence. Do we need to get students to complete all types of question on a paper? Can we remove certain questions on a paper or swap them for others? So as I mentioned just now, uh, that will depend on the centre uh, and your evidence for tags doesn't need to be based on a complete question paper. So you can cover off question types across papers. Not all papers need to include calculate uh, or assess or evaluate as long as you as long as you can map that you've, you've, you have gathered evidence for each of those assessment adjectives somewhere along the line, and that, that's robust and supports your judgments for those holistic teacher assessment grades, that's absolutely fine. Um, and the suitable range of evidence is, is, by your, is by professional judgment and using the centre policy. And as, a, as I say, as a guide, you should probably reflect on the range and content and assessment they would normally have done uh, or expected to have done this summer uh, using the, obviously, the adapt, uh, including the adaptations we had around field work. So, um, obviously, there wouldn't be an expectation this summer that they would have done familiar field work questions, for example. So, that's not something that you need to consider. 
Um, we've got two different classes studying GCSE, different abilities. Does all the evidence have to be the same across both classes? So ideally, yes, it should be consistent evidence because uh, a differentiated approach isn't really warranted in general, um, as the judgments are holistic. It's important that the range of evidence and the tasks that you're getting them to you're using to, to draw out the evidence are consistent as possible to allow for consistent judgments. However, there may be some students who have missed more teaching or more assessments for totally valid reasons, and that can all, that's fine. So that just needs to be flagged up on the assessment record. But as a as a general rule, yeah, you don't you want to get you want to make sure that your cohort is having is using the um, same evidence or you're using the same evidence to make those judgments. And again, sort of on the flip side, um, when you've got different teachers set, uh, marking across, you're going to internal standardisation of their marking is going to be key. Um, just as it is when in the old days of GCSE coursework or now with uh, non-assessment, non-examined assessment, non-examined assessment. If you've got different teachers marking the same piece of work, essentially, or the same task, you need to make sure that they're, they're, all, they're all marking to the same standard. Um, it's obviously it's unlikely in geography, but if centres do have students studying different topics, and that might have happened if students have missed stuff and you thought well actually they missed that but we'll give them this to do because it's more straightforward or they're more it's more they've got more uh more resources there um it may not be possible to have identical evidence however some consistency in the evidence evidence should be there and you can probably do that by maybe giving them all a you know a lot of, um, comparability in the task that they've given so maybe if they're all doing a past paper um they could be set the same past paper uh, so a, a past paper, I should say, but just with with the different topics. So say like one group, a couple of students didn't do climate change, but they did do water. You could put the water questions in theirs and the climate change questions in the other in the other groups. But they're essentially both doing a full exam paper, so the the task and the evidence is the assessment is consistent. I think this is the last one on evidence. Yes. <clears throat> Um, our students did mock tests in year 10. We have their marks, but no longer have their work. Can we still use this as evidence? So if the work this doesn't have to be mocks, this could be a piece of something else, classwork or, or something, a project they did last year in year 10. If the work was done last year and given back to learners, right, before any realisation it might be needed in the future, there's a fair chance that it might not exist anymore, it might be lost. So I think in this case, it's reasonable for, to use a copy of the assessment, so the evidence can be a copy of the assessment and a copy of the teacher's mark book or the marks. Um, so that's, that's fine, okay? Um, don't worry if you can't get your hands on evidence that's over a year old. Um, as long as that will, you know, that will be outlined in the in the centre policy. Okay, moving on to additional assessment materials. Why do the assessment materials only contain past paper questions? Sorry, there's a typo in this slide. It actually says history, but um, we're talking about geography today. But it does highlight the fact that this is consistent across all subjects. Uh, this slide is 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 applicable to all subjects, or pretty much all subjects. Um, so the approach was set out by Ofqual for the additional assessment materials, and it was really just to ensure that there was consistency and maximum support in terms of the standardised examples and standardised questions, because obviously all of these past questions have been through the system. So we have a lot more data about them, how they performed, how hard they were, how accessible they were, uh, what students uh, have said, and we've got actual student answers to provide in the grade exemplification. So they're a lot more reliable in terms of uh, the exercise, the purpose that we 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 we, we need them for now than um, than new questions that um, obviously won't have won't have all of that um, won't have been through all that pre-standardisation and standardisation 
of the mark scheme and won't have any data attached to them in terms of how they supported how they were how they were performed uh, and, and on results plus and things like that which you can use obviously when you're selecting your questions um, my students have already done all the past papers what would you suggest we do if we need to run more assessments so yeah if you've already done all the past papers you may already have enough evidence um, that you can use uh, just through that and the course of study to, to do the teacher assessment grades you might not need to do any more um, so it doesn't need to be this this evidence doesn't have to all be new and generated now in a certain window um, just needs to be drawn it can be drawn from any point in the course of study but you might need to do some recap of teaching and learning uh, particularly, as I say, things didn't go down down very well. As I know, for many centres, it was a real struggle during lockdown. Um, so you might want to recap on stuff and then assess using material again. Some of this this material again. Um, but I think the key thing is just to think about the purpose of why you're doing it. If there's no benefit in doing it again, using a past paper for a second time, then there's no point doing it. Um, because more of the same doesn't necessarily, isn't particularly beneficial if you've got that evidence elsewhere. You can make your own assessments as well using Exam Wizard and make up your own questions. You can use questions from textbooks, so you can run it how you like in order to collect the evidence as long as it's consistent. And obviously, um, do, do use the Exam Wizard because it is uh, a good way of putting together um, an assessment of any size or of any length or of any uh, profile that you want in order to match what students have been taught or what your centre policy says. All right, let's move on to some questions about grading. What standard are teachers using this year? So the key thing is not to make it any easier or any harder for a student to achieve a particular grade this year uh, compared to previous years. Um, so this is the same advice that we gave schools and colleges in 2020. Um, standards haven't changed. Um, and the key thing is really, if, you're going to, if you want to look at past outcomes or grade boundaries or any kind of indicators from the past, is to look at 2018, 2019 grades. Um, these are the ones we've got the most confident in, as this is these were kind of normal exam series where where we were we able to apply consistent national standard. Whereas the November, October slash November 2020 series wasn't typical, wasn't a typical exam series, and the cohort that sat there wasn't typical. So things like grade boundaries and your performance outcomes um, are not going to be typical of the standard. Um, so it's best not to use those because they'll be slightly skewed. Okay. Um, what grade boundaries should we use then? Can we use the November 2020 boundary as well? Caution, always, always apply caution when you're using grade boundaries, okay? Particularly, I mean, which is the same in any year um, when you're doing, when you're making judgments about how students are, um, level they're working at. But this year you need to be particularly careful because you're making holistic judgments about their performance. Um, so really you should be using the grade descriptors and that grading exemplification. Um, but obviously, you know, you can use grade boundaries to mark assessments and give you some idea of what level they're working at, as long as those that data, if you like, or those marks are not taken as kind of, well, that means that, you know, that was the grade boundary then, so therefore they are an A. You need to then take that material they produced in terms of the um, questions, um, responses, and match those to the performance, the indicative, sorry, yeah, the grade descriptors and the and the exemplification to make sure that, that they, are, um, they are hitting that. So it can be used to validate rather than drive, as I say, drive your decisions. Um, we've obviously, we, be, we do publish those paper level notional grade boundaries every year. So you can use those to validate your holistic tag grades. Um, but yeah, I don't use the 2020 boundaries because um, that's not, they're not going to be reliable. 
for this exercise. How do I account for SPAG when using generic gray descriptors? Well, I think where you have borderline cases, um, so where you've got where you're not where you've got um, cases of students where you're not sure whether they are which which grade to give them, it's probably a good idea um, to revisit any evidence you have that has questions that have used SPAG. And just, just consider what effect those marks or those responses may have had on the overall grade. Um, if they push them one way or the other, uh, are they skewing your skewing you, your evidence because they've done um, like maybe they've got done two, lots of questions that have had spag attached to them, and is that giving them a disadvantage? Is that disadvantage them? So just, just really, um, you don't need to dwell too much on it, but it's useful to, to, to think about SPAG and just check that it's not um, where, where it, it might support uh, adjustments in which, uh, particularly in borderline cases, because it's only a small number of marks, but it may tip students one way or the other in terms of your holistic judgments. I don't, yeah. So in, if there are individual assessments that you've done and you're using marks to support judgments, just go back and check when, you, when you're making those judgments if, there, if there's a borderline case that the SPAG isn't skewing you one way or the other or you're comfortable with it, with the, judge, with, with the performance. How do I account for a student who's improved their grades from year 10 to 11? Can I still use year 10 mocks but award a higher grade? Yes. So if a student, most students will probably show improvement over a course or um, so if they were, say, working to a grade five, if you, if you look at your evidence of their mock results from year 10, their grade five, but then you have evidence, more recent evidence from this year uh, of grade six, then students should be awarded a grade six. Um, you just need to make that clear for that rationale in your assessment record. Okay, more, more on grading. This is the last one on grading. How do I how do I reach a holistic judgment using grade descriptors? Okay, so we, we have talked about this, so I've talked about this, but just to bring it all back together, um, you need to consider the quality of the work, looking at the grade descriptors and the grade exemplification. Um, you can use past papers and notional grade boundaries to give you confidence in a grade, but you can't use it to drive the grade. If you find that evidence covers more than one grade descriptor, um, you use a best fit approach. Um, now, this is an approach if you mark out A level NEA, it's an approach you'll be familiar with. Um, so it's not there's no hurdles or secret hurdles or battle barriers to entering a level. It's about uh, the best fit. Um, so for example, uh, for a student who has many grade six characteristics, some grade five and a single four, a grade five or six would be appropriate since there are more grade six then six is likely to be most appropriate. Grades are holistic. So there's no kind of atomization of things or, well, they said this or they've got that, so therefore they automatically enter that level or they haven't done that, so they cannot access that level to holistic. Teachers may wish to consider the nature of the evidence that was, uh, and when it was produced as part of the judgment. Um, yeah, so again, this is what I was saying about the year 10 versus year 11. Um, if the evidence isn't recent, then you can um, use evidence from the recent, more recent evidence, as long as you explain that rationale. If it's different, obviously, to your centre policy. So let's have a quick look at uh, coursework A level, A and A, NEA. So, getting lots of questions about this, as you'd expect. Is it being moderated? No, we're not moderating. I think most people understand that. 
um, but you can use it to inform the teacher assess grade. Do they need to complete the proposal form? Well, yeah, they should have by now. Uh, this is all about, you know, this is about their the validity of their in study, isn't it? Making sure that what they come up with is derived independently. And do they need to complete the authentication sheets? Well, yeah, because we still need to, you still need to check that it's their own work. Um, can we tell them that there are any A marks this year? Um, yes, you can. As I said, you can tell the uh, you can tell students which evidence you're using and how they performed in that evidence. You just can't tell them the overall holistic tag grade at this stage before results. My students uh, started but didn't complete their A level coursework. Do I still have to mark and submit it? Um, so obviously we're encouraging the completion of, of NEA, and they should do this, and there's the usual deadlines, um, but they shouldn't penalise them if they were unable to due to the, obviously, the circumstances we find ourselves in, in which case you balance the weighting, how important you're going to use the NEA against other sources of assessment evidence, such as mocks or, or other tests or assessments or classwork. And you can look for the sub, the uh, supplementary skills. So they might have done a project. You could look at some paper three for A-level that's got quite a lot of AO3 in it, similar skills, or um, some other ones, that, other, uh, yeah, paper three that's got some of the statistics, yeah, the statisticals. There's, like, there's some in paper two as well. Wherever you can find the, you can find the AO3, um, you can draw on that as evidence to supplement. Um, and again, you just have to record all your rationale and your reasons on the assessment record. So that's all of the FAQs. Hopefully that they're reasonably comprehensive. Find out when I look in the chat in a minute. Um, quickly then, let's have a look at some of the support before we... Um, what time is it? We've only got five minutes. So hopefully um, questions are being answered in the background. Um, if not, we've got to have five minutes at the end just to have a look. Um, qualification web page. If you go to the quals page, whether it's the A level or A GCSE A or GCSE B, you'll be familiar with the filters on the left hand side, teaching and learning materials. If you click on that, you get the drop down or you get the filter, which shows you all of the um, categories. Um, if you if you go there, you can find exemplar material. And you can find assessment materials for students and assessment materials, additional assessment materials for teachers. They're the main the main areas to look for the guidance if you haven't already found it. Training wise, um, there's on demand uh, training page here. So you can click through. And you can filter by qualification of subject to get pre records. This can support you with marking um, and feedback sessions from previous series. GCSE geography support. Uh, there's quite a lot of stu exemplar student material that we had previously before the pandemic, as well as the new exemplification material. Um, there are guides um, as well for each paper, uh, past training content I mentioned, um, and then there's lots on Kamal words and keywords and maths and, and fieldwork skills as well if you need to uh, consult that. Um, before making judgments or creating uh, assessments. Um, A-level, very similar um, support there. Everything that you're probably familiar with, plus the summer 2021 assessment materials, which is your grade descriptors, grading exemplification and mapping grids, and additional assessment materials. And then just to give you a quick overview then, in terms of the past papers and sample material, we've got GCSE A and B, there's a sample assessment material, specimen paper, then there's the June 2018 and 2019 papers and the November 2020 paper. Uh, and then these are the paths that you can use for past questions. And AS and A-level geography, you've got the same SAMS, specimen papers, AS, you've got 2017 
and then you've got summer 2018, 2019, and uh, pay, full papers, and the October 2020, full papers. Um, just, just remember the 2020 series was unusual, so although the questions are fine to use, just be wary of that the grey boundaries, um, and obviously the exams reports and things, were, the cohort wasn't, wasn't obviously as, as a, a normal cohort, so you just have to use that with caution. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't use it as your kind of one of your main main pieces of evidence. So that's the end of uh, the presentation. I'm going to have a look in the chat, um, see if there's anything. Um, so there's a few questions Hi, John, about. Yeah, Hi, Hi, uh, yeah, I've been doing my best to answer all the questions. Um, quite a few around grading and reaching sort of decisions on different pieces. Quite a few questions around NEA um, and also a few questions about international and where to get all the information for international. So please do, yeah, do keep adding your questions and we'll do our best to answer them. Yeah. Um, so on the international, um, so their timeline's slightly different. Um, so there's going to be unseen materials released, uh, I think it's in May at some point, um, and then also additional assessment materials as well through May, middle of May. Um, but the principles are the same in terms of the coming to your grades. It will be using grade descriptors, exemplification. Um, the only difference the only difference is the timing there of the release of the materials. Um, so we've got some. So we've got some specific questions about evidence. Um, so in terms of selecting evidence, I think as long as your evidence is is consistent across the cohort. Um, that's fine. Um, what you can't do is break it down and say, well, we'll take that bit of that paper and this part of that paper and those students did well in that and those students did well in that and kind of create it, create a kind of uh, picture like that. But if you gave all the students the same, then obviously you've got your evidence is consistent and, and then you're, you can use your centre policy will tell you which which evidence you're going to use to to make the judgments. A few people saying they're using the 2020 paper but not using the grade boundaries, which is wise. But you can still use the performance indicators and the um, the grade descriptors. Yeah, so there's a few questions about the um, paper three for spec A, uh, spec B. So I think that is quite a holistic um, assessment. So I think, I think the decision was not to break it up into separate topics and questions, but it would be best to run it as a as a as a as a scenario, as a kind of as one assessment. If you wanted to, if you hadn't taught that, if you weren't comfortable with doing that, but you had, say, taught topics seven and eight and nine, or just seven and eight, in quite, in, you know, quite comfortable with that being secure, not content, there's no reason why you can't use the questions um, from the past papers to assess those topics and not do the full D&E. &E. Um, we're not saying, by not doing that, we're not saying you can't do that. I think we were just trying to work out what was what was most useful and we thought that most centres would probably not not want to do that. But there, there are bound to be cases where, where you've only got through topic seven and eight. And so you only want to assess topic seven and eight and you don't want to do nine and the whole decision making piece. Um, where can we find the grade descriptors? So the grade descriptors are on the JCQ website in that document.
So if a pupil X achieves an A in one paper, pupil Y achieves a B in a different paper, it's the other way around. How can you use the sources of evidence consistently? Do both pupils deserve an A or a B? Well, if both pupils did both papers, then yeah, then you would you you would use them. You could use those. Would be fine to use those because they've both done the same task and the same. They've got the same evidence. They just achieve differently in different papers, which is what you'd expect. In a, you know, what happens all the time in a normal year. So you, you're making the you're making the the tag judgment at the qualification level not at the paper level. Um, yes. Yeah, so if we've got the same five assessments for every student, can we pick the best three or four for each student, even though they might get different from each student? Uh, I think it would depend on the assessment policy. Um, I'm trying to think why you would why you would do that. Um, if if some of those assessments were old um, in year ten, then I can see that you might say, "Well, we're going to put more weighting on the two assessments we're doing this year," um, but we we've still got these other assessments that they've done. So you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't be able to choose different assessments for those students, Rosie, unless there was a reason for it. Like they weren't you had to, they had to do a different paper because they, you know, for a different there might be a valid reason for that. They might have missed the course or something. But if you're giving them four papers, um, then we're assuming that they've, they've done the whole course. Okay, we're running out of time. So I don't, yeah, you can't, it depends on what your centre of policy says, but because you have to apply the evidence consistently, uh, you can't cherry pick different students for different assessments, because that wouldn't be consistent. The only way you can do that is if student, there are, students have a different, there is a reason why that student um, is unable to perform you know, there's a valid reason why they, they haven't been able to perform on that assessment, like they were ill that day when you gave them that assessment, for example. Tony's saying you should take a holistic view across the work completed. You shouldn't exclude things that will inflate. <clears throat> yeah, you should follow the school policy. Please could you advise how teachers can show that we have used the grading descriptors and grading exemplification when marking an assessment? Do we highlight the pupil's work? Do we write a summary statement? Um, I think that's an internal thing, isn't it? How you do that is going to be how you, how you manage that in centres how you want to do that is going to be up to you because you're not submitting it to us. Um, okay, I'm conscious of time.
NEA and AS fieldwork question, can you use them to get more AO3 evidence for pupils with no NEA? Yes. Um, yeah, I, th I think so. I'd have to go and have a look at the, the grids. Um, I think they're different AOs. I think the AO3 in A level is different to anything in the AS. Um, but I need to double check. I think there's any. Might be wrong. But yeah, have a look. Have a look at the AOs if they're the same. Then there's no reason why you can't do that. Good question. Okay, um, how are you getting on in the, in the other box? How are you getting on in the Q&A? So I think if we wrap up at maybe at 10 past five, because we're over time, um, just gives anyone a few minutes, a couple of minutes in case they think of anything else they want to ask. Um, but hopefully we've covered off the main main themes. We can't, it's obviously very difficult. We can't respond to specific, is it okay to do this? Is it okay to do that? Because it's all about the sense of policy. Um, and uh, we can't endorse any particular approach. So, um, but if you've got questions and you don't feel they've been answered today, then do contact me um, you can do that through the support portal. Um, if you go to the, the website, contact us. Um, I think there's an ask a question and you can choose geography or there's an email address, which is teachinggeography at pearson.com. You will get a copy of the PowerPoint. Um, if you can't download it, I don't think you can download it from this um, module. Um, you can, you get sent it, I think. Yes, because it's got links in it, hasn't it? So you can, you can, you can uh, access the resources. Thanks, Isla. So Isla's noted the questions they're not going to to get to, and we're going to update the FAQs to include those. That's great. Okay. So I think... If everyone's okay, we'll end the session now. Um, as I say, if you want to ask any follow-up questions, you know how to contact me via the subject, by the portal or teaching geography at pearson.com email uh, and the communities as well, which is a relatively new thing. And that's available via, via the support portal as well. It's like a forum. So do feel free to ask questions on there. I've been on there today asking a few questions, answering a few questions. Okay, thanks very much, everyone, and um, have a really good evening. Um, and um, thanks for thanks for your time. Thanks for coming. <laughs>